I did get arrested that night. You know, I had to go to court, go through the whole nine yards. And I, so around this time, though, I was still trying to think toying with things. I was still kind of had the I don't care attitude about life a little bit, I'll admit. So during this, during while this is happening, my girlfriend gets pregnant. Wow. And that was the big turning point. Um, you're 19, you don't want to be having a kid. And even looking back then, I was like, oh my God, I, my girlfriend's pregnant. I can't believe this. I'm screwed. You know, that's how my mindset initially was. Look, looking back now, which I've told many people, that was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Because I left, I literally walked away from all those friends, the whole drug scene, and never looked back. So from 19 years old, I haven't ever called you out of it. Called me out of it. 19 wow. years old, I never touched a drug, never did anything ever again. And all because I got my girlfriend pregnant. You know, so, and that son, you know, that son's doing great now. <laughs> that is so well, incredible. So. How old is that son? 34 now. Well, Jim, it's so awesome to meet you, sit yeah. down and chat with you. It was good to getting to know you uh, just even before we started recording yep. and getting to know um, how big of a heart you have and uh, how, how much you like to give back. We'll talk about that. Sure. But it'd be really good to just let everybody know, uh, you know, about Jim Kennedy, Kennedy Photographers. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your business. Sure. So we're based in Orange County, California. We're a wedding photography studio and we've grown a lot over the years. I shot my first wedding, you know, over 20 years ago. And it kind of grew into a team effort where I have a, there's five photographers now for County Me. And we do about 150 weddings to 200 weddings a year. Wow. Um, and we're known in Orange County. We've been going strong for all these years, which is pretty tough market to be in. And I just love it. I love weddings. It's been a passion of mine ever since I did my first wedding. I knew this is what I wanted to do. And it's just kind of taken off. And I think that passion has turned into the success of the studio because all my team feels the same way I do. So it's worked out well. What, uh, so how, uh, what's a, what's a, uh, a competitive story, right? So you're in like probably a pretty competitive market, <laughs> right? Are. What's what's like a great competitor story that that you actually won a wedding that you knew you were uh, competing with? <laughs> well, it's hard to know, really know that, I guess, because, you know, the, bri the brides aren't really telling you who they're interviewing you against. Yeah. Um, so I don't really could look at it that way. I guess the competitive story on my side would be just reactions to people as I've grown over the years, how I took my business. People weren't always, when I first started my business, it was just me. I was working super hard, getting my referrals up and I would, shoot maybe 90 weddings a year by myself. And I was referring another 50 to 60 out to my friends. And after a while I realized, why am I doing this? I'm not getting any referrals back because no one's working as hard as me. So I'm giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of business. I find that doesn't work for me anymore. And so I'm going to find a, a photographer that wants to work for me. And then I, that's how I grew the team one at a time. So I got that person busy enough and I grew another one, kept going. Okay. Which, so a lot of the, my competitors around town weren't too happy in my team effort because they felt like when people refer my studio, if I was booked, then I could pass it on to my other team that wouldn't go to them. So the competitors in town weren't happy with that. I was yeah. like sucking in all the business. Yeah, there you go. So what, how, how do you, how do you get your business typically? What's uh, is it mostly word of mouth at this word point? Word of mouth referrals. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. I figured that right out of the gate though. That's how you had to get your business going. Um, the first year I did 15 weddings. My second year I did 54, third year, 76, fourth year, 98. I still remember the numbers cause I, yeah. how fast I grew. Um, but it was just building that referral base right out of the gate. That's all that really matters out there. Do you set goals for how many weddings you do? Not anymore. The land is just come. Um, I just was, whatever I can take, I'll take basically. Well, what's, what's maybe unique about orange County, uh, weddings, uh, as opposed to other weddings in, in <laughs> throughout the country. Well, I feel like we have a strong wedding market in general. We, first of all, year round weddings, weather's always good there. You know, some States have, you know, what wedding seasons in a sense, um, from super high end weddings we have to lower end weddings, you know, in the middle of the road weddings. So there's just a huge market there, but there's also, which it's turned into a huge market of photographers too that have uh, kind of swooped in on that area thousands upon thousands of photographers wow um so it's tough to keep your you know competitive out there because there's just so many to compete with the digital age opened that up more i think people just grab a digital camera and they watch a couple of youtube videos and they're now they're the wedding photographer so how what's uh, uh how many weddings do you think happen in a weekend i couldn't even imagine as in, in southern california oh, yeah oh Probably a thousand or who knows how I have no idea. I never really looked at the number because I couldn't imagine. That's Thousands, maybe. Yeah, it seems like it would be a you, lot. Because you got from San Diego, Orange County, LA County, which is, you know, millions upon millions of people. There's weddings everywhere. Well, what what uh what's peak season for you? Uh at you know, how many how many weddings do you do in a weekend in peak season? Um, it could be anywhere from like four to eight at the studio. So we did eight, um six, May fifth, sixth, seventh weekend. We did eight that weekend. It's like I said, there's five photographers, so we could do it, you know, three or four a Saturday. And build from there. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. Well, um, what's uh, what's maybe the most memorable thing about one of your team members? Something you like? You, they are unmistakable because of X. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't. My team members. That's crazy. I think we just synced up so well. They're like family, and every one of them that I brought on, they have kind of become like almost like a sister to me. Right now, they're all four of them are females that work for me right now, but they're all like super like family, and they've all had the same big hearts and the passion that I do about their their clients. Like. I get so many reviews from like couples on them that it's as if it's their studio. They approach it that way and they're all the same that way. I wouldn't say one stands out over the other one because they're all exactly the same. I can't imagine having a more committed crew. I mean, they've been with me a decade, all three of them, three for 10 years, one for seven years, and they've never thought about going off on their own. What's your secret to get somebody to buy in like that? I could think they know right away that I care so much about them and their success. I do. I've, I shot for a studio when I first started way back in the day and I, I learned a lot there, but I knew I was not valued as much maybe because I just buy the pay, you know, just enough to get by. Like me and my team, they make more on the wedding than I do when they shoot the wedding. I make sure they're overly compensated. Um, I, I'm caught, you know, conscious of their time and effort, all that stuff. You know, I, I want them to feel like it's their business too. And they do. And then they have the freedom to do whatever they want. It's like they're like, almost like a co-owner in a sense. That's how I kind of treat them. Okay. And they, so they don't have the desire to take off and compete with me. Yeah. So you're bringing in the leads. Right? I, bring every, I book everything. Yeah, I bring in all the leads. I don't do anything. I just tell them where to go. And they get to be creative get to and be creative. feel like they have uh, an ownership. And they have the whole week off. They work the weekends, week off. You know, can't beat that life. <laughs> yeah, you can't beat that, especially in Southern California. Yeah, that's so amazing. That's kind of the goal for me. Just I just really took what I learned when I worked for a studio. I learned how I, what I liked about what the guy did or what he did I didn't like. And I just, you know, changed it. Um, and when I broke off from there, that was kind of a big step for me, leaving that studio when I, where I learned everything. But I just knew it was time. I, I saw the... How far i could get with that studio yeah well i mean like your uh path, pathway to entrepreneurship is kind of an interesting one yep. right tell us tell us a little bit about that story kind of how you how you sure. got into entrepreneurship <laughs> it all started i guess when i'm young i mean maybe i was always out hustling my whole life you know i guess i mean it didn't start on the best path maybe not the most legal path initially i'll be honest with you mm -hmm. <laughs> so when i was in high school i lost my mom i was young and then i from there i kind of fell the wrong, down a rabbit hole the wrong hanging on the wrong crew Fell into drugs for a while, realized I don't want to pay for these drugs. So then I decided let's make, I'll sell them for a little while, make the money, do them for free. And then, but I learned quickly that was a mistake. But what I did learn from that is I knew how to, I learned how to read people. It was, I know this is kind of an odd path, but think how I got there. But it's so crazy. <laughs> hey, these are skills we've developed along I'm the way. I tell you, it worked out. I mean, I, so I did that. I think God might, you know, I'm not promoting this, but I, you know, I learned how to read people really quickly. So I, you know, I went down that path and then, once I realized that was a mistake, I got out of that path, and then I went to a, you know, a couple jobs, and kind of every time I was, I was sales jobs, I was like selling beer for a while, then I was selling cars for a while. There yeah. you go. You were doing the sin <laughs> trades. Yeah, you know, drug exactly. dealer, yeah, exactly. selling beer. Yeah, right. Uh, and then used cars. No new cars. Oh, new. Okay, new good. New cars. Yep. I was just kidding. I know. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I, I know. thought you were gonna work. No, I, know. I should have. I should have. Um, but I guess. I'm going to sort of fast forward past a little bit and go back to that later about that history. But um, once I got it, found out I wanted, I was good at people skills, I never had a passion of photography ever in my adult life. I never even thought about it. And then my buddy of mine was, had, did a, had a, was working for a place that did his pictures on ponies for a company. This is a crazy story too. And he goes, hey, Joe, I bet you on the weekends we buy a pony, we can go hustle and make some money. And I go, all right, let's do it. So we went to a horse auction, bought a pony. Bought a van, trained it how to jump in out of the van. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! This is some guy's <laughs> random idea, and you—he no, he worked. He worked for a company that did these pony pictures. Like okay, so he had already done this. He did it for a company, and, and I, you I got, then and, found a pony. And I told him, "Well, we could probably do it on our. We talked about we could probably do it on our own. You need to work for somebody to do this." So we we went and bought a pony. That's that entrepreneurship. Exactly. We went hustled okay. all day. Well, yeah. This is a long time ago. We were we, we did it. We were making two three hundred bucks each a day, just walking around with a pony all day. And back then, it was good money. We were like twenty two. <laughs> what was that conversation like with parents in the park with a pony? It was better than that. We'd go door to door, knocking the door. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. I mean, so what was it. your pitch? You walked up, you knocked on the door, you do, say. Doing pony pitches in the neighborhood today. <laughs> 50, 15 to 40 bucks. It was cheap. People flocked to us. We'd have moms flocking out of the neighborhood to us. We'd line no it up No way. And, um, that's like ice cream, ice cream truck exactly, on steroids. Exactly. Okay. That. So anyways, that's what kind of started my whole photography path. Like people that know me in the photography world would can't believe they went to like all these famous photo art schools and all this stuff. I go, no, well, how did you get started with a pony? Uh, you know, door to door <laughs> pony picture yeah, sales. Well, but it worked out well, you know, so we did it. Then we bought a second pony. Then we 
about a third pony. And then we trained people how to do it. We had about four ponies at one point. We dropped people off in different <laughs> neighborhoods. Back then, it was a Thomas guide. I don't think anybody knows what a Thomas guide is. No. It's the map book before phones. Okay. <laughs> so we had, yeah. we, we'd give a Thomas guide, grid it off. You go here, I'll, we go there and tell them where to go. We pick you up in a couple hours, you know? So it was our little business and it took off. That's amazing. Yeah, that's what got started. So, so were you, uh, uh, so as a drug dealer, did you if, do have a similar playbook where you <laughs> set up multiple? You know, no. just kidding. No. It seems like you're good at deploying four teams of four I can, or five. I can deploy teams. That's been, <laughs> I was solo back then, me and my buddies. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah. Sorry. No, did, no, no, I like that. probably a sensitive subject. No, no, it's not actually. I look back on those days and laugh now because it's, it was a short time in my life from like maybe 17 to 19 years old. That was You're 19 eight, years old 17. selling pony pictures? No, no. I'm talking about the drug stuff. Oh, you know, I was about to say. No, 17, 19 was that time in my life. Okay. It came and went pretty quick, but I learned a lot from it. Made my mistakes, learned from them, and got past it. Um, the pony pictures came later, like maybe 24, 25 years yeah. old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> you kind of jumped over this one, but it seems like uh, something worth chatting about for just a minute was uh, you experienced loss, yeah. right, with your mom. Yeah. Um, Stitch that together leading up to, you know, maybe some uh, a victory in your life, because it seems like you've got you had experience loss. Yep. You maybe lost direction a little bit mm -hmm. and then started to find something. Talk talk about, you know, the experience of loss and maybe the, sure. the reflections you've had along the way. Yeah. I, up to my mom passed away, we had like the perfect little kind of blue collar life. You know, my mom was a stay at home mom, make it, you know, dinner on the table every day at five. My dad was a truck driver, pretty much gone a lot. But we had kind of blue collar life. But then also my mom gets diagnosed with cancer. And then, um, you know, fast forward a little bit, she didn't make it, you know? Yeah. So, so that was a, just starting my senior year of high school then. And then, so that was a big jolt, you know, obviously. And then my, so basically I had a perfect little home life. And brothers and sisters? I had a sister. Sister, okay. And she was like basically going into high school at that point. So then we had the perfect little family. Then she's, my mom passes. My dad's a truck driver, never home. So my sister gets shipped off to live with a family member. And I'm finishing my senior year basically alone in the house because my dad was always gone. Mm. So from the perfect little family, now I'm just alone in the house. <laughs> so that was a big jolt. And that's why I kind of felt like I, I mean, I made the wrong choices. I kind of gravitated towards kind of the party crowd. They were just easy to hang out with. They took my mind off everything. Mm. So that's why I kind of went down that path. Mm. Um, and what led me down like the roads I kind of touched on already, you know, kind of, I used to avoid drugs like a passion, Yeah, you know, because I'd always turn it down, turn it down. Um, even when I worked at a pizza parlor, the owner of the place would always offer us drugs, that kind of thing to the employees. And I always would turn it down. But until then, I, until that What happened, part of the country? This is California. Still California. Yeah, Alton is California, Southern California. And then he's the one that introduced me probably to, um, and then I finally gave into that once my mom passed. We, I, was drink, I worked at a pizza parlor, then we, you know, the drugs came in there. And then I started doing it with the employees and it kind of led me down another path. And, but having doing all that, so then I went, you know, get in trouble. I mean, I could get to a little bit. So, um, like I said, I started selling drugs, which wasn't the best thing. Yeah. But I was like the everybody's friendly drug dealer. Everybody yeah. loved Jim. You know, so friendly. I was, I was like, so, so I only did drugs for a short bit, and then I stopped because I realized this is it for me. But I did kept selling past doing them. Okay. Because the money. And did you ever get like in trouble? I did. Okay. So that's what kind of was a jolt. So then, okay. um, one night I, we had a house, and then by the time I moved out of my house, my dad's house, and we had a house with a big two-story two house in Whittier, we get raided. You know, the cops come flying through the windows and stuff. So, um, you know, you hear the cop shows, like when the guys pound the doors of the big thing. That was my house. Down. Oh, the, man. The doors didn't open. They jumped through the plate glass windows, cops everywhere. Um, but I didn't have anything on me. They came at a bad time, you know? They, <laughs> so, so I had like been of like $50 worth of drugs on me. That's all they had that night. Too. So, but that was a big wake-up call. You know, I would say so. I did get arrested that night. You know, I had to go to court, go through the whole nine yards. And I, so around this time, though, I was still trying to think toying with things. I was still kind of had a I don't care attitude about life a little bit. I'll admit. So during this during while this is happening, my girlfriend gets pregnant. Wow! And that was the big turning point. Um, you're 19. You don't want to be having a kid. And even looking back then, I was like, oh my god, I, my girlfriend's pregnant. I can't believe this. I'm screwed. You know, that's how my mindset initially was. Look, looking back now, which I've told many people, that was the best thing that could ever happen to me, because I left. I literally walked away from all those friends, the whole drug scene, and never looked back. So from 19 years old, I haven't. It never called you out of it. Called me out of it. 19 wow. years old, I never touched a drug. I never did anything ever again, and all because I got my girlfriend pregnant. You know, so and that son, you know, that son's doing great now. <laughs> that is so well, incredible. So. How old is that son? 34 now. 34. <laughs> Wow. Yep. So that was good. I mean, 
looking back, even my girlfriend's parents weren't a fan of me. <laughs> Everybody did, was it. They kind of weren't a fan, and, but they saw how I gave that whole world up. And then I went and got a job, then a second job, then a third job. I was working three jobs. And I just, that was that work ethics kicked in, you know. So did you consider that moment uh, sort of uh, some sort of divine intervention or? A little bit. So I used to always think that my mom was like looking over me a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, that's good. We called you out of it. Got you, <laughs> got you set on the right track. Call me out of it. So you, you, you know, <clears throat> Uh, leave the drug scene, uh, a dad, and uh, you enter into a sales career. <laughs> I know, exactly. So leave that scene was a big thing. You know, so I, obviously I got the three jobs. And then I, was, then I was working horrible jobs. I hated them. You know, but I was working like at a mail room for office building in the morning and then going to a Italian restaurant in the back, washing dishes, and then cleaning car dealerships at night for a janitorial company. That was my life. And I go, this isn't going to work. You know, I, so then I... My buddy had worked, got a job at a car dealership selling cars. And he said, Jim, you should come do this. You'd be good at this. And so I went and got, it got hired there. So that was a game changer. I was able to quit all the three jobs and just focus on the car sales. Again, car sales, I get is I attribute car sales to my long-term success. I did that for about three years. And that's where I really honed my sales skills and learn. I can figure something out in two minutes, how much money they can spend or what they're thinking. So break that down for a second. What are, what are some of the signals that you looked for and how did, how do you, how do you use that skill of being able to understand people and. Yeah, it's like questions they might ask. Um, they might tell me about their life and just how they're living their life, where they're living, just all these little things. I'll, I can figure out how, what, how much money they might have to spend. Uh, they start talking about certain subjects that they just focus on the price of the car or payment, just stuff like that. You know, just little things that would maybe I know what I need to focus on to get the sale done. Or like they'd be looking, I, know, I figure them out quickly. They're looking at too expensive a car and I'll flip them into something that's a little more affordable but close to what they want. So I was really good at just figuring them out and putting them where I need to be, get them. So that was good. it worked out well. I, I don't know. I just felt it felt natural to me. Okay. Yeah. So, but I literally, literally attribute that success, my success to those days is figuring people out. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, uh, how'd you, how'd you get into, uh, past, you know, you're selling cars. Were you still doing pony picture no, sales? No, no. <laughs> you went into cars. No, and cars then you was went before back. ponies. Cars was before ponies. Before ponies. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm not a photographer yet. You know? Mm. Yeah. So that was that. All right. So, so you're selling cars and then selling cars. Okay. I have a kid. I have like, a, my kids like, you know, about one, you know, maybe six months old when I got this job. My son was about six months old. So I did that for, you know, for about three years. And I realized I didn't want to really do that anymore either. It got kind of old. Because back in those days, car sales was always just about, about getting as much money as you can at the same time. Yeah. It wasn't, so it wasn't like a feel-good sale, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. It was like me trying to bury you into a car payment and make the biggest commission I can make. Yeah. And I didn't want to, didn't want to do that. Yeah, so it didn't resonate with you. It didn't resonate with me. I didn't feel good about it. You know, even though that's what you have to do. The sales teams, you, that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So then I wanted out of that. So then I started applying for, there was a somebody I knew wanted to work for beer sales, like a beer sales distributor for Miller Beer. And I go, that's like a decent job. I can sell beer, be a beer rep. Because it had all the things you want as a parent. You know, okay. the, the 401k, the car allowance, all the stuff you might want, medical insurance. But you needed a college degree to get this job. Okay. Which that wasn't me. Yeah. So how that? So, happen? but um, I was relentless. This uh -huh. this place, like, it's kept. Like, that's like proves to me. I tell people, you, you don't have to have a college degree to be successful in this life. To me, I think it's pointless. Like, if you don't, if you don't have the opportunity to go, who cares? You have the other opportunities because it's proven to me. This is a corporation, corporate job. The only little bit of corporate job I ever had in my life was this. And, but the guy finally gave in to me. He goes, he, I just kept calling him, even though he kept saying no. And I, I, I just, and he finally said, okay, Jim, I'm gonna give me a chance. You won't let me, you won't leave me alone. Because I was always cool about it. I called him. He'd always laugh at me. We'd laugh about it, you know? And he finally gave how me a chance. How many times did these phone calls happen? They probably went on for about three months. I mean, wow. just going back and forth with him, you know? But um, he finally gave me a chance. And I got in that job. I probably, so everybody was happy I had this job. My, my wife's parents, everybody's happy. But about six months into it, I go, I was not happy. I was unhappy. Because so I looked at what I was doing. I looked at something that's the same corporation. 20 years later, doing the exact same thing I was doing right now. Yeah. They've been doing it for longer. You, you saw your future. I saw my like, future. It was yeah. horrible. I just couldn't could understand. And I, I remember getting trained by the guy driving me around and just listening to his life. It just sounded horrific. It just he didn't do anything. He just did, that was his job every day and go on weekends and just wait for to rinse and repeat the next week. So then I go, I got to get out of this. And that's when I was kind of keeping my feelers open. That's when the pony thing came out of nowhere. So it's about eight, maybe eight months into the job. Now I'm quitting the job. The guy that gave me a chance. The biggest, the funniest thing though is I told him why I was quitting. The guy had hired me. And he laughed. He goes, "You're doing what?" He couldn't believe I was giving up like a good corporate job to go pull ponies. <laughs> I should never told him that, but literally, it was the best decision I ever made. You're like, it's complicated. <laughs> There's a pony involved. I always tell people too, that's a small decision of life you make. That was, a, I mean, that was kind of a big decision, but it's still, I was just, it wasn't that big of a deal. I said, I'm going to make this decision and go with it, see what happens. 
I mean, I had to, what I have to lose? Even though everybody was against it, my family, what are you doing? You know, my wife's family, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. But I, I wasn't gonna live my life like that, you know? Um, it probably why, why was that so visceral for you for you to go and because that's a that's a it's a sort of uh you you come out of uh loss into uh kind of like a, a really bad situation that you're like man this isn't for me and then you go into another this isn't for me yeah and so like what is it why why was it so visceral for you to like i just have to do this it's weird i think back and i, I still wonder where that's embedded from in with me i don't know where it comes from to be honest with you mm. because it's always been there it's i don't know what it is um so i just always had that feeling i just don't want to be do something for the rest of my life i just thought i maybe i guess i could look back like this i think my mom um well this is my dad had passed before this too i didn't even touch on that so oh be, so, like, so i lost my mom and then three years later before my son was born my dad passed and i think that might have been part of it so i list, listen to my parents even talking as I, I was growing up they want to do this they want to do that but they never did anything. Someday we're going to go here or somebody there and then they died. Yeah. So you have a life is short. I, I, I think that was where it really came from. It had okay. to be that because I just always think about that. It's like my mom was obsessed with Egypt, like went to the King Tut exhibits, all that stuff as a kid. You know, yeah. her dream was to go there someday. Did she ever go there? No. You know, I've been there already. I've been all over that place. You know, so it's like I did. If I want to go somewhere, I go. I don't hesitate. You know, okay. So I'm, I'm going to go do it. I don't care if I have a thousand bucks if back in those days. If I have no money in the bank, I don't care if I could go survive for somewhere in China, say for three weeks, I'm going to go for it. You know, that kind of thing. But it's like, I feel like that's where it comes from because people just wait till retirement to do anything. I never, I can't wrap my mind around it. Why people do that. And I, most people I meet are like that. Most of my friends are like that. I travel alone all the time. <laughs> so it's like, they just, no, I can't, I can't, I can't. Why? I'm waiting. I got, it's, it's always an excuse. It's like, it drives me up the wall. So that's always been embedded with me. So then like same with these jobs, I knew I was going to have a, not a happy life. I looked at how unhappy these people were and it wasn't going to be for me, you know? So, or some people, like I said, get happy. Eventually they settled. They just kind of settled. This is my life. I'll, I'm going to make the best of I'm happy, you know, but th that wasn't going to work for me. So, so how did the pony sales picture sales evolve? <laughs> so once I took that job, I quit my beer job. I, um, told the guy I was quitting for that. He gave me a bunch of grief about it. Kind of pretty much laughed at me, really. <laughs> but anyways, I went on and did it. But I, I felt like it was involved great. Me and my buddy, we had, like I said, we had one pony. We turned into a business. We had one pony, we had two, three, then we had four ponies. We trained him how to jump in out of vans. We were, people would still laugh at us about what we were doing, but we were making pretty good money back in those days. You know, we, and we made our own schedule. So now I'm working three, four hours a day, making a lot more than I made to the beer company, honestly. And yeah. it's like, and I saw the freedom happening. And, okay. then, and then I saw, well, this could leave me to, that's that's what got me to photography i didn't know how to take a picture after the camera on auto the whole time we knew how to do four poses camera on auto didn't know what i was doing and like I mean, photography thing is pretty good it creates freedom for me i think and i saw how people reacted to the pictures so excited so i said i can get into this i felt good about it the money's there and i can build from there so so, so back in the day right so what what when, when is this with the pony pictures i mean is this 90s yeah so Early nineties. Are, are you do you doing Polaroids with like instant no, not Polaroids. delivery? No, we didn't film, but it's no. We take it to one hour lab, come back the next day. Okay, so one you day had turnaround. To, you had to come back. Yep. Okay. What did did you upsell or did yep. you find other people or what did you do? The way I'd sell the sales because I'd like to come back and sell them. It's easy because you put, you take the picture in the day, then I'd go back at night after we're done shooting. Then I'd run around the same neighborhood and sell, do the sales real quick. Okay, so what you would do is you would get all the pictures taken, and then what what sort of conversion rate would you get? You would take the pictures. And then, I, you know, you came back with eight pitch, eight, five by seven. That's it. Five dollars. We tell them five dollars a piece or we say two, like two for 30, four for, you know, 40, that kind of thing. You know, okay. just to try to get 40 bucks out of them. They, that costs us a dollar to print those. So it was great. That's great. And we go. So how many so did, did everybody buy? Pretty much. Yeah. Everybody wow. would buy. We didn't even get 20 bucks out of them. We're fine. We're not going to not sell anything. Yeah. I mean, some people, we'd always time it too. Like we, like we knew what cities to go to, like when their paydays were, we knew how to time everything out, where did, what neighborhoods, like we had it all figured out. You know? So you had a grid, you knew the timing, yeah. you knew what to charge, you had good packaging and yeah. you had a sales process. Exactly. Okay. And we made it as refined as possible. It was just really easy. And it was all built around creating freedom in your life. Freedom in my life. <laughs> Me and my, and I, yeah, it was awesome. It was all about freedom. And I think, I wish more people would be like that these days. You know, I think some people are starting to, but I think it's just so important to have that freedom in your life. It's just, so good. What do you, what do you, what did, what did you start doing with your freedom? Well, I, at that point, nothing yet. Cause I'm okay. still trying to get my, you know, on my feet. 
because that first few years, don't get me wrong, we're making money to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Um, and then from there, I learned how to, I, built, I wanted to maybe span into family pictures now, where I want to take it up a level. Okay. Um, so how am I going to learn how to do family pictures? I wasn't working studio. So I used to go, I knew the, I, I knew the beaches people take family pictures on. So I would just go sit on the beach and watch photographers do their thing. I would just sit there and watch them until I kind of got a comfortable right posing and stuff like that. I would sit there and watch them that way. And then I, and then I, was, then I could start trying to sell myself on doing family pictures. Because like I said, no schooling, not, nobody teaching me how to yeah, do anything. Yeah, so you're a self-taught for Yeah, so I went, sat on the beach and watched people take pictures. Wow. Um, and then once I got that going, I jumped in the family pictures and I learned that business. And then I and then I learned another person was doing baby pictures in home. I, so I learned how to do that on my own and I turned it into a business. I bought yeah, by telemarketing list and we can call people who just had babies and do free home sittings for them. So that was another business I had. I just bought telemarketing lists. All the hospitals would sell the list of all the new parents. And you can call, hey, you want a free portrait session your baby today? from the hospital we, that was our pitch that's amazing and they said okay come over and people just let us come over to their house it was crazy like okay come on over like so i just call on the phone next time with their house shooting pictures but i guess back then people were more trusting I guess. How, how much did how much did the hospital uh sell this list to you for? it was actually it was like some kind of time i mean it was probably like 400 for the list or something like each okay. month not that much okay you, you'd make it back in a couple of sales and then you you, yeah. you had people calling out you know all, yeah, call them. Just to go sell photography, yeah. you know, photo sessions. So I, then I go shoot for a few hours a day and knock that out. So that was okay. good. But all this led to my journey. So th then I'm just doing pictures, still just getting by. What really opened me up for freedom was, um, you know, when I fell into weddings. Because I, a friend of mine, this is a big thing. When I say little decisions in life make a big deal. Not the big decisions don't mean anything. Even like buying a house, car, who cares? I mean, it's like little decisions would set you on another path. So one time, my girlfriend of mine, I was a family portrait. She had a, she was a se second shooter for a wedding photographer. And she said, Jim, I'm so sick. He can't find anybody. Can you just go? I know you're going to use the camera. I didn't even own good gear then. So I go, but I knew I kind of was interested in that. I was, I remember, I, was supposed to, I remember this to this day. I was supposed to go to Vegas with my friends that week. I canceled my trip. I'm not going, guys. I'm going to do this wedding. They're going, you doing what? I, so I went and rented gear. I told the guy I had my own gear. I, didn't, I lied to him. I said, I have, my, I have all the gear. I'll be there. So I went and rented everything. I mean, I, I lost money on the wedding, basically. But then once I did the first wedding with him, I saw, this is what I want to be doing. I saw he had a good life going, you know, owned a home, had a family, you know, charging a lot of money. I go, this is this is my next thing right here I'm going after. So I went and bought a book, how to, you know, photograph a wedding, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> a wedding <laughs> photography. Uh, for I, that was only one time I worked with him before he called me back in. So then I had a couple of friends I was going to do weddings for free for practically. So I went and bought a book, how to photograph a wedding. My early wedding pictures were horrible, like so cheesy. Um, but that's where it started, you know, just on a little book I bought. Do you have like, um, this is a pricelessly bad shot, like frames? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have a frame, I should though. Just the cheesy stuff, you know. You're like, this yeah. is horrible. Yeah, horrible, okay. yeah. But yeah. um, are you pretty hard on yourself as it relates to uh, uh, photography uh, oh, yeah. quality? I am. Okay. Even nowadays I am, and I've shot a thousand weddings. I just still, every wedding I'm so obsessed with making sure I come through with the client. Because um, ultimately that's, you know, I do have a passion for my, the like, people hire me. Yeah. Uh, even from even the pony picture days, I want them to be happy, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what turns into success too. You got to care about your clients. So how did, how, so after that wedding was Jim, you know, Kennedy, the business, the photography business born, right? No, no, for no, weddings no. or I, I, you're like, no, that guy so called me back a couple of times. I worked for him like three years actually. And that's why I learned a lot of the business Okay, in, in Orange County. I got a feel for it. What he was doing right. What, what I thought he was doing wrong. And he was a successful wedding photographer in that area actually back then. This guy I was working for. Yeah. Um, were you sort of an apprentice in yeah. your mind? Yeah, okay. I was second shooting. Then he let me work in the studio for a little bit. I figured that all out. Um, and then he had me shooting for him, kind of like I have a team now. And nobody nobody really had teams back then, but he, he had me shooting for him at that point. But then really, I, but I was doing all the work. I was doing the selling. I was doing the editing. I was selling myself. And he was charging a good amount of money for me and paying me basically nothing. So I knew that wasn't going to last long. Yeah. So then probably once he did that. You knew the value of sales. Yeah. So I just said, I, I don't... I mean, he's I'm done. He's not doing anything for me, so I'm just gonna move on. He was shocked when I quit that day, and even he resented me for it actually for like six months. But then, he, but I was always honest with him, and he called back six months later and apologized because he knew he treated me badly. So yeah, but that was a big decision for me too. So you knew if, you knew what it felt like to be undervalued, undervalued, and I was always honest with him. And, and you'd I'm, been an I'm, entrepreneur, so you, yeah, I, I knew I could go for it. I'm not scared of risk, you know. I know I was leaving a job that's keep me steadily working, but it wasn't enough money there to keep me. It wasn't like it's not like I'm leaving a job where there was a lot of money there where I am risking losing something. I wasn't really, I knew I could still make the money. He's paying me doing whatever if I had to. He's like that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Wow. So uh you quit and then yep. what'd quit. you do next? Start my business. Yep. And I guess before this is when um 
I did the trip to China, you know, a little before that time too. Okay. Yeah. Before I, so I travel started, you know, it was like, um, before I started my business. Okay. Yeah. It was like early stages with him. And so you have a family at this time and you're yeah. starting to travel. Yeah. I had a family, had my second kid. So I have a daughter too, three years later. So, wow. so now I have two kids and, um, but now I was starting to travel too. Yeah. So, uh, trip to China, how did that, how did that happen? And, uh, sure. So from this is what spawned my whole thing about traveling, which I think is so important for people is to get out there. It's like, I, I was a car salesman for three years. I, I was, had a good friend there, a Chinese guy actually. And he, but I left there, we, we kind of stayed in touch, but he, he called me one day out of the blue said, hey, Jim, I have this friend out of China. They really needed an American salesman to, for the, for it to come work for them for these little jobs here and there. I go, you sure? He goes, yeah, you'd be perfect for it. So I met with the person. They said they need somebody to help get, we get help get Chinese people to get into, into the consulate to get their visas. I said, okay, I'll, I'll just go for it. I never been anywhere at that point, but I knew I'd always wanted to go somewhere and they were paying the bill to the trip. I was still nervous about it though. I said, Hey, can I bring a friend and you guys pay for it? Just, I have somebody there with me. And they, so I talked him into it. Yeah. So I, I brought somebody with me to kind of do it with me. Um, and we got over there and I figured it out quickly, but we were staying in an apartment in a local neighborhood in China. No tourist it wasn't touristy at all what I was doing. And, but that's what spawned me to stay away from the touristy stuff. Cause I was actually meeting the real people eating dinner at their houses, you know, getting to make friends with their family. It was really cool. Yeah. But again, that was my sales thing it kicked in again there. I was able to sell our way into the consulate. A lot of people aren't able to do it. I was able to talk our way in to get them to the front of the line. And my, even my buddy who went with. So you started we, adding value. Yeah, adding more value. But my buddy who went with me, he's doing the same thing. He was able to get anybody in. You know, So they used to call me over there big lucky because everybody they gave me, I'd get into the consulate. And that's why they had me back nine more times. So I'll say I did so well. So that were like a year and a half, I, I spent a ton of time in China. That's so incredible. All over that place. So uh, it looked out good. And so what were the drivers for you uh, con continuing to do that? Oh, the travel. Yeah, from there, I, what a driver was from that. Once you get a taste of that, you want more. You know, a lot of people have never been anywhere, but they don't. The, why you want to go to these places? I think once you get a little taste of it, you know you want more. Just to see the families, how they react to you being a part, helping them, being a part of, the, of their change in their life. Yeah, you know? but you, you uh, left Southern California for these extended periods of time to yep. basically go stand in line. Mm -hmm. in another country for another person. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Like, walk me through wh why that was a thing for you. Like, well, why, why why that sure. was so uh, motivating for you. I think when the lady told me the story, how these people at works that I'm helping out have worked so hard to try to get a, a break in life, to get a chance to come to America was the dream. But sometimes it's hard for them to get into the get through this line. It's, it sounds crazy, but it's, back then it's how it was. It just kind of inspired me to like, especially when I got over there and met the people. I guess when I first said okay to it, I wasn't really sure how much I'd be drawn to it. So I really didn't know what I was getting into until I got there. And then I started talking to these people and seeing, I mean, these young people have been working so hard. Or every family member's pitched in money to get this one person to America that will change all their lives. The American dream, you know? And I saw, when I saw that, and I saw them in tears when they got approved, like when they got to come over, the family, I literally had moms drop into their knees on the streets of China hugging me. They couldn't, I couldn't believe it because they knew their lives changed at that moment. You know, yeah. So that's what. And once I got that happened the first time, and that's why I wanted to keep doing it. So, how over what period of time did you continue on with these trips? So this is when with the car sales. I'm trying to keep the time. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's after the it's, car sales. It's, 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 right, so it's right. at the beginning. Probably <laughs> I'm the photographer doing the. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of doing the family stuff, tick, trickling with the weddings, just around the assisting time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nothing like there's no there's no success in my life with the photography yet. Yeah. I just like I said when I went to China, I had no money, but they were paying the bill to go there, so I just went. I went for it. So you're you're a proponent a proponent of the American dream. Yep. Mm -hmm. Over in China, helping uh, how many how many total people do you think you helped? Uh, Probably about because it was maybe twenty or so. Twenty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing, man. Yep. It's a, and that that's was an, ama that's an ama there. I've never <laughs> heard somebody that's like. I'm going to go across the world to go stand in line for somebody to for them to achieve the American dream and be able to come to the U.S. Yeah. Have it's... you stayed in touch with any of these people? One of my friends married one of them. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, crazy. Now they're you're still matchmaker. married. 25 years later, they're still married. That's oh crazy. Goodness. But uh, that's the only one, though. But, uh, that's the only one I stay in touch with. But um, it was good. But it, that's what spawned my passion in real passion in life is getting out there and making a difference in the world, you know? Um, and that's what oh, my started my own business enabled me to do that because I, once I got kicking, I then I opened the I started making the money and then I opened the doors for me to be able to do what I want to do. Okay. Once I left, started my own business. So yeah, talk to us about how the you know uh, Jim Kennedy Photographers yep. was born. Yeah. So when I left, I that, that, I told the guy I was leaving him. I was with him for three years. I start that I next right away I was hit the ground running. 
like I said, my first season, I did 15 weddings. So it was pretty slow, but enough. I just took those 15 weddings. And I was able to market them into many more weddings. Cause I, you know, I was, t- I was doing slideshows of the weddings. I was, I quick turnarounds. I, every venue knew me. I'd give them pictures the next day. I'd, I'd make sure everybody knew Jim Kennedy. Mm-hmm. So they would not forget me. And every time I did a wedding, I'd make sure every vendor remember me. So then the word of mouth can spread pretty quick. Like I said, I only did 15 the first year, but I did 54 the second and then 76. And at that point I was turning away weddings. So I'm, you know, I was booked. Cause like, it was just you, uh, just me, you know? So then what made say, you decide to scale after, you know, 70 plus weddings that I think like I was telling the beginning when I was saying, I was referring so much wedding out, weddings out and not getting any back from anybody. And I started doing the math. Yeah. And, and not everybody wants to run their own business. I've learned people say, how do you get good? A lot of people, the excuse I hear all the time, well, I can't trust anybody to do as good as I'm going to do it. And that's, I don't understand that concept. Like, it's an excuse. It's largely. an excuse. The whole world, world runs around businesses running by other people. So yeah. not, how could you think you can't find good people? I mean, every look, look around. So people want, so not everybody wants to run a business. You know, like everybody works for me. They don't want to run a business. They love the freedom they have with me. And I, I almost think if I work for a Jim Kennedy, I might like the deal I have right now too. I might, I, I'd be hard for me to leave me. If I was working for me, say, if I just painted that picture in a sense, because I make it so easy for them. Yeah. I'm, they're paying, they're making most of the money on the wedding. I'm doing all the back end sales and stuff like that. And we're all winning. You know, uh, so this is, this is going to sound uh, very psychology esque, but I've been, I, you know, I read a lot of books. I was reading one recently and um, just the word can't that you just talked about. Yeah. I, I can't trust somebody. Yeah. Uh, you know, the difference between uh, someone who's neurotic. Versus somebody with a character disorder. Mm-hmm. The words that uh, someone with neurosis, some, somebody that's neurotic, they are the ones that will take responsibility for them. They take more responsibility. It's like, okay. it's my fault. I shouldn't do that. I I couldn't do that. I should not have done that. You right. know, or I should do more of this. Right. Those are people who take probably too much responsibility right. for their own actions. And then on the other side is people with character disorders <laughs> that <laughs> that say I can't do that and yeah. and they I won't do that. It's not something I'm. It's not right. possible, right? Right. Kind of that fixed mindset. These are like very real things for people that uh, as it relates to. I called it a ceiling. Okay. And when I when I, I so I've run three businesses. Okay. I got three businesses to five million in yeah. annual recurring revenue three times. Okay. And I had this ceiling that I had. Right. Right. And this mindset that you're that you're talking about, somebody saying I can't trust somebody to do it yeah. as good as I do, they've hit a ceiling. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. So, like, I, I always am I'm interested uh, to learn from people. Like, what was a ceiling that you had, or some sort of fixed mindset that you had that you pushed through, or you helped somebody else push through? Yeah, I don't think. Well, as far as my ceiling goes, I don't think like I had one ever. My deal is this. I don't think I really had to deal with that much, really. Even the people that brought on with me, I feel like it's kind of just kind of fell in sync, and everything just kind of happened in organically in a yeah. way. So I never really had to battle through that. Even so, how do you encourage people to do that? Because you're you're in you're you're uh, helping people push through some boundary that they had at yeah. the at the consulate to try and get them in. What are some of the things you encourage people to to do to kind of get away from that mindset? That fixed mindset, those ceilings that they have. Oh yeah, yeah. If you're talking about people, just generally, yeah, like life people around then, you. I, yeah, I was, okay, yeah. It, not just my team working for me. Yeah, I just try to be I, by example. You know, I just kind of show them what I've done, and and the people that have kind of followed me a little bit, like say my travels and stuff like that, then they get a taste of it. Or the people that trusted me to say that did come on to work with me initially. But I think it's so important to have your character strong, and people you have a good name for yourself. All these things factor in when you're trying to pull people to your side, mm-hmm. like. So if you last around, everybody knows Jim, like you, Jim's not going to do you wrong. He's going to make sure you're covered. It, like even the people working, they knew coming into it, they felt really good about working for me. I proved it to them really quickly. So I think that's what it boils down to. It just, yeah. you got to lead by example. You know, I know it's kind of cliche, but it's true. You know, they got to know they can trust you, the people around you. Mm-hmm. And once they see they can, I think they'll run through brick walls for you. You know, that's how I've looked at it the whole time. So what would be for somebody who has that, I can't do this mindset, what what would be some things that you would say rather than, so leading by example is great for people who are following you, but maybe like, what is something you'd say to them to encourage them or woo them out of that mindset or to consider an alternative? If they said, I can't do this, whatever they were saying they can't do, I might just show them maybe a way they could like, I can't go travel to this country right now. I just can't do it. I might show them a path where you can do it or I can't, you know. I think about hiring another person. I've talked to other studios. That I'm sure I'm open book. You know, the photographer, I'll tell you how I did it. I don't care because I know nine times out of 10, you're not going to do it anyways. I've learned that too. I used to do little workshops. I would tell That's my whole story. That's really I, Every little thing I did. And, the, and I still have no competitors in Orange County to do what I do. And I, I, I don't mind sharing everything. I want people to succeed. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I just tried to look for the path that, you know, whatever the, whatever the roadblock is, I was to convince them otherwise, you know, how the that roadblock should be let go of. Okay. Know? So that's how I look at it. Okay. So at wh wh what point are you doing kind of a, uh, I, I, I liked hearing um, just in some of the story that, that we were, you know, learning more about you. You talked about this false summit, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're doing a, a lot of high volume, you know, a few years into the, the photography yep. studio and then yep. you hit sort of a false summit. Talk to us about that moment. Sure. So when you get to a point, well, I can pretty much max myself out by the way it's like a shoot at some point, you know, it's, that's why I feel like, well, I, where am I going to go from here? So now I'm thinking about, so do I want to own a job or do I want to own a business? That was my mindset at that point. Like right now I own a, I, well, at that point I was by myself. So basically I owned a job. If I stopped working, I stopped making money. It was done. So I didn't want that. So I knew like, I couldn't have the freedom. I, and I was trying to get where I was, I was losing that freedom a little bit because I was working a lot. So I feel like how am I, I building the team was the key where I can own a business now, create more freedom for myself. And that's what that, when I hit that ceiling, that was my next thing, avenue to go for. Okay. Because I didn't want to just own a job anymore. So I tell people all the time, photographers always, well, oh, I can't get photography. Like, you own a job right now. You know, if you stop working tomorrow, you stop making money. And me, I can stop. I don't, I never have to shoot another wedding again. I can just keep booking my team, you know, and I'll, be, I'll still make an income and they'll be happy. I'll still be happy. And I, I can just take the rest, you know, time off. So I just kind of look at it that way, you know, just um, owning, owning a business, not owning a job and expanding my business that way. But not going too big. Another thing, people, I don't know, people try to go too big too. It's, you know, I, I, just, I look at my life, what I need to make and the life I want to do. It's, it really doesn't take that much money to live a good life. Mm -hmm. if you really think about it. If you do make the right decisions in life, I figured that out quickly too. I've been all over the world. I know people run $10 million, $20 million companies and their lives are boring. They do nothing. They're so consumed in their business, they have no life. But I've taught people how to travel cheap and have a better experience than stand up four seasons. I treat people how to run a business on the slim, you make a good profit and you live in a good life, you know? So I, I just, I can only do what I've learned over time on my own. So like I said, I never went to college. I have no business experience. I have nothing. I just kind of learned on the streets basically, but it, you can build a good life. You can build a good life, you know, you know, without having to think, overdo it in a sense. Yeah. Cause sometimes you go too big, then you're more tied down again. Cause now you have so much more responsibility. You know? Yeah. So when, when you uh, were doing 300 weddings yeah. a year, yep. right? Yep. Like you, you all of a sudden get some big IRS bill. Talk to us oh, about yeah. that one. They definitely have my roadblocks. <laughs> but basically what it was, so this is, yeah, when I was really, this, my business was booming and I still didn't know what I was doing. So I get an accountant back then referred by somebody. I didn't really do any due diligence. Like, all right, fine. Let's go with it. It wasn't really IRS. It was actually the state um, franchise board sales tax. Oh, they were, he, the, my account was doing that wrong. This is a service. Yeah. So, and, it, so it was a service, but come to find out, you're supposed to charge a sales tax on this. Oh man. Um, and he did it is as, it because, as is if it he did because it. you're selling as if retail with the photo, the photos. You're creating pictures and oh, might be album and stuff. So, so for, you, do know, you have to you, do that in digital to today. Now you don't, if you don't get many products, you're clear, you're clear, oh, but man. in certain States in my state, it's like that. But back then he didn't know what he, I didn't know. I was, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just telling people what I'm making. You figure it out. But he, to the tune of 150,000, all of a sudden I got his bill and they were auditing me. And this account, then I saw him, this account say, just they'll go away. They, he kept, then I realized this guy was scared to death. That he's like, just lock your door during the day. Eventually they'll give up and not bother that, you. That anymore. was his advice. That was he told me. Oh. I realized I made a mistake. So then I got, oh my, I'm screwed. Lock my door. So it was unbelievable what I got myself into. But they came after me and they were, I had to pay it. You know, so I had like a year and a half, they big, like eight, 9,000, whatever it worked out to be. I paid it, but it was a huge hit, you know, out of nowhere. They That's had that a massive bill. setback. Yeah, it was a big setback. Um, How many I, people were working for you at the time? Then we were probably had about seven photographers, and I had editors, and I was pretty big, you know. And then I said, I really just, you know, <laughs> it was tough. But I found a new accountant, thank goodness. So key, when you are starting off a success, get the right accountant, because mm -hmm. that could steer you wrong. It was disappointing, because I, I actually liked the guy initially, but that's because he was a friendly guy and I thought everything was fine. And then, then I, he, his true colors came out. Oh man. So it's okay though. I learned from it. It's all good. <laughs> I worked through it. I made it. I got out of it. Um, you know, it is amazing to me how many people that I know have had uh, surprise tax experiences yeah. that have really shaken their business. Yep. It is like, I remember it was my, it was my first business. I was, I was actually selling real estate. Right. So I had, I, it was the first time that I'd started, uh, an S corporation well, it was actually before the S corporation. I was doing a sole proprietor yep, yep. and you know, all of a sudden I get this, I'm saving 25% for taxes. And then I get 
four, it's actually more like 40, 50%, right. That I'd have to pay. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, now I need to figure out how to move money around. And that maneuvering is, a, is, yeah. is a, a remarkably difficult. And it is an inhibitor. Yep. It is, it is something that's like, Hey, I just want to take pictures or, Hey, I just want to make cupcakes. I didn't realize that I have to figure out how to, <laughs> to manage it was at the beginning of my success too. So it was right when my business just started kick, you know, booming. So it's not like I was 10 years into it when I hit, maybe I could absorb it better. It was right when the money started to come in heavily. Now I'm getting this big bill out of nowhere. So I, I, all of a sudden, I'm finally getting ahead, you know, then this happens. Man. But, um, but again, I guess all these things that happen in life for a very reason. Then I learned my lesson, got a good accountant and, you know, they got me on track and all was good, you know? So, um, it, it was tough at the time. I look back on it and just kind of laugh now. It's like it figures <laughs> another another thing in my life, a little robot. Yeah, yeah. So so are these W two employees that you have? Ten ninety nine. They're ten ninety nine. Yeah. Okay. Um, at the, that's kind of changing now in California. That's, those laws are always changing too. You got to yes, stay on top of that stuff. You do. They're fighting off that ten ninety nine stuff too. So that's. Um, but it, it's ten, been t- it was ten ninety nine for many years. Okay. Yeah. So, All right. Well, good. But well, it works out good. So uh, so now uh, talk to us about you know post that uh, talk to us about growth and. Yep. You know, where, where you guys are at today and where you're headed. So back in those days, so we had, a, a, you know, a big studio offices, all that stuff. And then, you know, over time you grow, you get bigger. I moved into a bigger studio. Um, we were doing great and all. And we still stay busy all these years until I was, I was taking a big, big fast forward because we were just booming, always shooting. I, most of my team stayed, was been with me forever. Um, and then I, but I, then I realized I have to, I was kind of overdoing it on the expenses. I, I kept getting a bigger space, bigger space. But I thought, what do I need all the space for, you know? So then I... Then I decided to downsize, you know, back go back downsizing, take things back down a bit because I was trying to do 300 weddings a year. We didn't need the, we didn't need to do that many to make the money, you know. Mm-hmm. So now we got rid of all the big expenses, and then got a then I moved out of my big studio, got a small little office, and then we're, now we're doing maybe 150 200 weddings a year, doing just as well and less to manage, more freedoms, less photographers. That's why I've never had had any more photographers. We have a little core five. That's all I'll ever want. I never want even one more. Um, so that's like smaller is better. You know, I realized that too. You get somebody to get too big, too much to handle. I really figured it out quickly. That was, that was getting spread thin a little bit. Freedom was fading away. So then I scaled it back down quickly and got the freedom back. Uh, I love how, so you're doing 300 with the big spaces and yep. the full studio. Yep. Uh, and then you're like, Hey, basically we're going to go office and shoot on site, shoot remote the whole time. Yeah. We didn't need studios. You didn't need studio. I didn't care about those. Yeah. We didn't really need it. So uh, uh, the, you went from 300 to 200 a year. Yeah. Right. Yep. So like you cut a third of your clients because it, it does it really like uh, do you think that the studio was a way to close deals or did e- that a third of those people absolutely want no. studio shots too? No, it was the studio was more like to impress people when they came in. I could hire this place. They got it together because I knew most people were meeting at Starbucks and stuff. Most photographers. So I was getting these sweet spaces to to sell how great we were doing in my mind. You know, that's why I had the space. Yeah. We weren't doing a lot of studio shoots in general. Yeah. We're weddings. You know? So it was, a, it was a glorified sales office. Basically. Okay. You know, we do some studio shoots people wanted. Mostly weddings. That's where the bread and butter is at. Yeah. And once I figured that out. And then, but then I also, generations changed too. As time, I saw the younger generation. As I was going on, digital age hit. Those people wanted to come in for meetings. Even pre-COVID, I used to tell people, we hardly did any in-person meetings anymore for consultations. But, you know, fat ten, 10 years before that, I was doing meeting after meeting after meeting. People wanted to do face-to-face meetings. But I think the generation's changed because everybody's just about digital world now. Let's do a FaceTime. Yeah. No one to come in. Time's time, time, you know, which worked for me. So then I, I didn't even need an office anymore. Because even pre-COVID, then I had, actually got rid of my office even pre-COVID before things shut down because we weren't even doing any face-to-face meetings anymore because people just didn't care about it. So a generation's changed. People changed. The younger generation grew up on the cell phones and FaceTime, so like that. Mm-hmm. They were all about just Zoom, mm-hmm. that, that kind of thing, which made my life easier. So much easier. So more freedom now. Now I can be doing whatever I want, wherever I want. I could well, be roaming the world, doing meetings and booking weddings, and now it, it just made it even better for me. I, I th- that's been uh, one of my favorite parts of our conversation is just uh, and and getting to know you is this idea of these personal projects. So yeah. talk to me about like love the locals. Oh yeah. So uh, through well, my travels, the stuff you're doing with all your yeah, new freedom. Yeah. Well, well, through my travels, like you know, after China, I was spawned to travel. I probably done like I don't know, lost track, maybe thirty to forty countries. I've kind of lost track multiple times, but. I'd always go to third world countries most of the time, like outside my comfort zones. That was my where I like to travel. Um, but I was always, you know, I'd always want to find little ways to get back. So initially, I remember traveling through Egypt. I would take pictures of families in a, in the middle of nowhere. They probably never had their picture taken, and I'd run to find a photo lab in the city and come back the next day. And they were reluctant to let me take their picture, but then I came back the next day with photos. And, oh my gosh, you got a picture of my kid! And 
then they all wanted to come in the, the village, come out for photos. So that was kind of fun. Then I saw how just giving back to little, in the small levels, you know, little, little things make a huge difference in people's lives. They were so excited. So that's what kind of spawned me looking for bigger projects. And I remember I was cruising to do Vietnam one time and I saw this group kind of building like a house or a hut for somebody. And I was with a translator and I go, what are they doing over there? And he goes, let me find out. He walked over and asked what was going on. And he said they would, they would just do projects for people. And I go, I bet you I can do that. I bet you I can find people that we can start our own little company. Um, and that's what the local spawn. I want to backtrack a little bit on that one though, because what another thing, little little things in life happen. So this guy I was talking to, me and the, my friend were traveling to Vietnam. We booked this little kind of off the grid tour. So I get car sick really bad. So whenever we I'm on a tour, I gotta get I gotta get that front seat of that van. So I jockey for the front seat. But be, be doing that, I was sitting next to the translator the whole trip. Like it was a five hour drive. We talked the whole time. We actually became kind of buddies because I get car sick. Otherwise, I'd have been sitting in the back of the van, probably never would have had a conversation with this guy. Yeah. So we talked about stuff, where he was from. I learned we learned all about each other. So then through the whole trip, we're constantly talking now. We're buddies. And then that's when I saw this little project going on. He found out for me. I go, I guarantee, give me six months. I'll be back with the group. We'll do that. And I, I made it happen. So that was what spawned all the locals. I, I took my employees first. My, not my, I would call them employees, my photographers. I brought my team out with me first to test the waters. So we found a family in, in the middle of rural Vietnam. We showed up on their house and we built, built the bathroom for them. They, didn't, they were using a dirt hole. you know. With, with, so we just showed up and my, you know, he would do the homework. He'd find the family need before we got there. And when we got there, we would hit it hard. So it was amazing. So we built this bathroom, like we digging holes, moving bricks. And my group, they were so just loved it. It was hard labor, but they were so happy to see these people change. This, that bathroom changed his family's life, believe it or so not. So true. <laughs> it's a little thing. So yeah. um, once I did the first one, and I go, okay, I'm gonna do, we're going to do more of these. So then I would go every six months. Because Vietnam is only a certain time of year you want to be there. When the green rice fatty fields are green and it's pretty. So every six months I would go there. for. I did that for about four or five years. Then COVID hit. That's what stopped her. I still okay. be doing it now. Um, but that was amazing. But also, I do them in Myanmar, the country of Myanmar. I because I love that country too. I go, I could figure that out there. So I, I would just reach out, email people there. I would do all my homework online, call people into other countries, and see if somebody would be open to helping me do that over there. I find a translator, and I just go over there and figure it out on my own. And I did that in India trips in India like that. But um, Vietnam and Myanmar were my main tour trips that people really liked the most. Um, and once you do a little bit of that, you just want more of it, you know? And like I would take people, like I said, change their mindset. People that had never traveled, but they always heard about Jim's trips through the whole wedding industry. Even my couples heard about it. My couples would come with me. They go, my wife now, the whole reason I'm married with her, because she heard about my trips, she wanted to go on one. And that's how we kind of got connected, you know? So they, everybody talked about these trips change your life. These trips change your life. You know, because everybody's like, just couldn't believe the, how just are building a water basin for a family. The whole, but another thing about these trips too, I tell people they don't want to give back to charity. You might just write a check to a charity, right? But what, does that really impact you? Do you really feel anything? Right, just giving away money. Yeah, it's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. That's a good thing if you can afford it. But it's nice when you can actually be face to face and really experience it one on one with somebody. Mm -hmm. And also during during my travels, I would see there's like fallen tourism. They call it. It's an industry out there, but they charge people four or five thousand a person to go do these trips. And I was thinking it's so expensive. Most people can't afford it. Uh, I was charging like a thousand bucks to a person, just enough to cover their expenses and build this thing. I was showing people how it doesn't make a lot take a lot of money to make a difference. Like there's a lot of people say, why, why do your charity thing, Jim? Because these charities have raising millions of dollars, say other charities, you know, you're not going to be a part of it. These, these that's, they're helping a lot of people. Yes. But my things that help one particular family, yes, a small, small, small little touch in life, but it's going to impact you for the rest of your life. Cause no one's really doing that. No, I mean, just trying to make a difference in just uh, like 20 people's 20 families lives over say four years, mm -hmm. but that goes a long way. You know, I, so there's other ways to get back in life without having to just like, write big checks or be a part of a huge charities. There's plenty of that going on out there. There's not much going on out there. What I was doing, just small little, just small impacts on people. Yeah. And it's, I don't know, it's just, it's, I've never seen anybody doing that. What I was doing out there, I've been all over Vietnam and China and all these different countries. It's all big, more big scale stuff. It's very American. Yeah. It's gotta be yeah. big. It's gotta be you big. Know, to, if it's not big, it's not important. Yeah. And the only person I saw was the one that spawned my idea. There, but that was a college group kind of on a college trip doing that little project. I saw that kind of spawned it for me. And there's no way like somebody could actually sign up to do that. It was like a college that came out and did that. Um, so then I, spawned, I made it possible for other people to do this kind of stuff. Just like we'd find families, build them a home, you know, or, or, or like, the water, it was water basins, homes, and bathrooms, what they needed the most because their homes were on the stick sticks, you know? Yeah. It, or one time I was hiking through the Vietnam. This is a good story. So people, you can always get, I was hiking through Vietnam, middle of nowhere. I found this little old couple living up the mountains in this little shack. I mean, it was, like, it wasn't even, it was just two of these tables put together, how big it was, just nothing to sleep in it. Holes raining through it, chickens running on, on the bodies. They were just old. It, it was horrible. 
So I rallied. I went to, down to the village, rallied my friend. I wasn't even. I didn't have a group there with me. Just my now wife was with me. She thought I was just showing her Vietnam. I go, we're doing a project, and I canceled the rest of our trip. We rallied the village. We got. We built. The, we went up in the mountains and built this, this couple a new hut. They, they were probably close to their 60, 70 year olds, but they were living. In, it was horrible. But it cost me maybe four hundred bucks to rally, make it all happen in a week. And now the people have a nice place to live. It didn't take that much. Yeah. It just you go down the street, you see somebody who might need something in another country. Maybe maybe fair away how you can help them. You know, mm -hmm. and you and you could leave that trip a much better person. What do you think drove you to do something like that? I think it just goes back to those China trips, seeing just how I just helped just me helping somebody get into a door to a place. They were like in tears how it changed their life. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I just wanted to be. That's why I call love the locals because I only like hanging out with the locals. Period. That's, that's, a, that's so. Good. That's, that's the best way to travel. You know, you be with the locals. And people say, other people say, oh, I can't afford it. How do you afford to go on these trips? People ask me that all the time. Well, I can go stay in Vietnam for a month for like thousand dollars. I, I save money when I go to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> I go out to or eat in Orange County. It's hundred fifty dollars. My wife, I could that feeds me for a week in Vietnam or two yeah. weeks. <laughs> you know, so I tell people you actually save money when you travel if you do it the right way. <laughs> that is, that's a great story. Well, talked about mm -hmm. what's Rona to the rescue. That's our dog rescue. We started me and my wife. My wife's passion was always been dogs, so she drew me into that one, um, rescuing dogs and fostering dogs. So. During COVID, that's when that started. Because now we not, we're kind of we're limited on what we can do to give back anymore because we weren't traveling anymore. So we felt we rescued my wife. My wife saw a dog being rescued out of a meat trade in China. Her name's Rona, and that's what spawned it. She followed this dog, so we, the dog made it to America. This rescue in China rescues dogs from meat trade, would ship them to America or UK to find homes. So she, my wife, followed the trail of our, this poodle. We applied for it and got it. Drove it to Seattle, brought it home, and that's what spawned us to do more for the rescue. This dog's so amazing. So now we foster dogs. We rescued all the dogs from China, and we sponsor dogs. So Rona Rescue is actually a legit nonprofit set up. People could donate, and we and we find different dogs in need or different causes out there in the dog world that need some help. So that's been really fulfilling too. That's Good. awesome. It, so, it, and then now you have an RV. RV because of the dogs. Because <laughs> of the dogs, and you're spending time traveling around doing that too. You know, during COVID, what we, we didn't want to sit around and do nothing. We decided um, it's time to, to find, figure out something else to do. So we went bought a used RV and. That's been our COVID travels, you know, till now. Things are starting to open up a little bit. So we'll start, yeah. we'll start hitting the road here. Sorry, hitting the road. Yeah. But, um, but that, hit, that's hit me good. air to go to uh, some other country. <laughs> yeah. Back out, get out there somewhere. Um, but went to Honduras recently, a few months ago, and did a little project there. It was fun. But all spawns for my business being able to give me the freedom I want. That's what it all come from. Like, yeah. Back to my photography business, I could block, I can make my own schedule. I could block out two months at a time if I want to. Even, and even the people that work for me can block out. They have the freedom. Same for my dude, because they can make good money when they want to work heavy. Yeah. I tell them, anytime you want to block out, I don't care if I have, if you all block out at the same time. It doesn't matter to me. We was, well, none of us will shoot weddings that month. You, you can do whatever you want. You're your own person. I don't want them going, oh, I'm, I'm blocked out. She's blocked out. I need you to work those weekends. Come yeah. shoot. I don't look at it that way. You know, I don't care. We just won't make that money that month, but no big deal. Everybody's having a good life. So mm -hmm. that's what's enabled me to do that. That freedom is building a business that you can, you know, block yourself out. And be able to have the freedom to go do things. Yeah, I really, I, I've enjoyed the freedom uh, and how you use that freedom to go create connection and to make a difference. Yeah, I, I, it's an amazing story. So that's been good. I, so I, right, because I just, I don't make the freedom, so I, the freedom, so I can sit around and do nothing. You know, I, yeah. I like getting out there and getting out there and meet people. Yeah, but it, again, end of the day, I feel that's what life's all about. You know, getting out there. You only live once, which probably spawns back to my, my parents young. You know. Another thing, I, another thing, a little wrench in my life, I could just touch on really quickly. Like I was adopted and I never knew that even until I was in my oh 20s. Oh my goodness. And my parents never told me. So it's another, I, that's why I look at life. My, my friends all chip out of how calm I am about everything. I, me and my wife have never had an argument. I, I never, nothing fazes me because I've been through so much crap in my life. <laughs> I don't care how bad things can get. Nothing bothers me. I see people get worked up over the dumbest stuff. I just think, you, this is crazy. Why? But I always have these crazy things happen. So I find out I'm adopted at about 23 years old. My parents have both passed away by then. My sister calls me out of nowhere. I guess a relative told her it was a, it was a big family secret. No one told us. <laughs> so my sister goes into kind of crazy mode. She's three years younger than me. So we're not blood sisters. We find out, you know, so but I still love her. She's my sister. Yeah. 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 But, um, but it's so anyway, so that was an interesting time too. I figured that one out. It's like, and that's why I think back in your life as a young kid. Yeah. Kind of things started to make sense. Well, I never saw pictures of my mom pregnant. It just little things I just started thinking about made sense to me, but I never held it against them. Yeah. Um, that was their decision. It was your different story. then. They were, I, it was a different time. They just, that's what, how they felt. It was fine. I mean, I wish they would live longer than I could talk to them about it maybe as an adult. They would have had this conversation and it never happened. Um, so then fast forward, 
to about two weeks ago. I have a sister came out of nowhere, messaged me. I think I'm your half sister, Jim. <laughs> so just like three, literally two weeks ago, I connected with a sister and we had the same mom. Because ants just because ants just Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. <Wow. laughs> so my life's always got crazy little stories that happen, you know. And that was one. Well, it'd be good to um, hear about all of the surprises. That was a good one. But I think just learning. I mean, even back to the days when I was dabbling with the drug world, I, I used to like your mom overseeing me. I remember there was one time. I get this is a bad story, but I was like I take a shower at my house. All of a sudden, my shower door opens. The guy with a gun and a guy with a knife ripped me out of the shower. I'm naked. They were coming to rob me because I had they that was the guy back then. With, they thought I had stuff, but threw me in the bed, duct taped me all up, all my head, my feet, my hands, everything. Threw me in a water. I had a water bed back in those days. That <laughs> was a cheesy drug dealer water bed. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, but anyways, but that so all these things happened to me. But I look back. I remember laying there thinking, "What's my mom was thinking of me right now?" I I, truly, I was like, she was always seeing me that day too. Like I literally should have, shouldn't have got out of that situation. I'll, you know, I talked my way out of it most of the time. I was talking, 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 trying to get my talk my way out of it to the point they were just so, getting so pissed they didn't find what they wanted. They duct taped my mouth too and left me there. And all and I my eyes, I couldn't see anything. I was just laying there. And then I was and all of a sudden I got quiet. I go, oh my God, they left. I thought for sure I was gonna get stabbed or something. And then it was, and then they left. And I took me about three hours to get out of that tape and get out of there. But another, that's another thing that happened in my life. You know, so it's just like I, I, as I just think about all the things I got myself into myself on my own bad decisions yeah. or things that were just thrown at me, not my decisions, just makes you the person you are. Like, I wouldn't change anything about my life, even my mistakes, because who knows where I'd be right now? Yeah. So or even if I wasn't put up for adoption, you know, who knows? I'd be a different Jim Kennedy, you know, Yeah, different one. Yeah. So who knows what would have happened? You know, so life's crazy. You said whatever you throw at you, you sort of go with it and make the best of it. That's so I've good. never been unhappy ever. <laughs> it's like, that's how I look at life. I'm always happy. Because it's a choice. Yeah, it's a choice. It's, yeah. it's just easy. And you see how bad it, And I used to go to villages. Another cliche people say, you see the poorest family in the middle of nowhere. They're the happiest people I've ever met. It is true, though. <laughs> they have nothing. And they're happier than most people I see around town. So you know, true. Where I live. You know, they're always worried about this or about that. The stupid things in life, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think all those travels really helped me be that person. And going through those little, the, the lose my parents, the bad decision times, my early days. But that, thank God, I was, I, by 19, I figured out that was the path I wanted to go down and and never look back, you know. So good. So well, good. Well, I have some rapid fire questions let's do it. for you. I'm ready. So um I only dabbled in uh uh photography and video, but um there's typically a preference. So camera question. Sure. Are you Canon or a Nikon guy or something else? Sony. Sony. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think you've taught a few people on our side. <laughs> Sony's where it's at. I, I was like, I was a Nikon guy before that, but I switched to Sony. Yeah. So. All right. Have you ever seen someone uh, get stood up at the altar? I've had people bail out that morning. Like I've got calls. The groom had cold feet the morning of the wedding. A couple times actually. And then the wedding got called off that day. Did you, yeah. Did, I couldn't did you believe it. make them pay? <laughs> they already paid. Balance is paid in advance. Wow. Yeah. They, well, they lose everything. So that was a good one. They literally, um, Actually, the makeup artist called me from the wedding because I knew, knew I was on the wedding. He said, Jim, this wedding's off. The groom took off. And that was that. Yeah, I've had some crazy stuff like the weddings happen. All right. Know. Are you married? I'm married. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you are. Okay. Uh, what was your... Oh, I thought Jeff was coming after us. Uh oh. Uh, what... <laughs> uh, what was your uh, wedding like? Where'd you get married? In Myanmar. We eloped. Yeah. You eloped? To Myanmar, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Mark was our efficient. He was. Yes. I did not know he was ordained. <laughs> <laughs> he was yeah so i got yeah video to prove it but i we wanted to get married because myanmar is one of our favorite countries um and we had been there multiple times and it was we got married in front of a thousand year old temple in the middle of nowhere myanmar it's rolled up on it we, we scouted out found the temple we liked the most did a whole wedding there of seven people there actually total counting us you know my wife it was amazing and myanmar was a special country which you can't even go there to anymore because the military took it over but it's disappointing but that's an amazing country i hope it go back someday i uh i i seeing the I've seen a lot of pictures from that country. It's definitely one of the places I would have loved to have gone. Oh, it's epic. That's, and the people are so amazing. It's just so sad what's going on there now. But my time there was special and I love it. Like we have, even have a couple of kids there we sponsor there, which is nice. That is nice. Um, and I'll going to backtrack to travel one more time. I want to do want to mention something else. Like another thing that was good for me is, is I've spent a lot of time in India. And when you spend, and I would do a lot of volunteer work for the people that, um, human trafficking, this thing called you, her future coalition is amazing. They, they, save girls from the streets, train them with jobs and get them independent. So I'd be a guy, go, I'd go there, take pictures of them and they, they want me to photograph them, but not in a way would make you sad. You want to make show the happy side. And that was huge for me. Mm. These girls, oh my God. You even have the emotion. They could, <laughs> the stories they had would break your heart, but to see how they're happy they are now. Wow. 
it's crazy. But that was a huge part. It's um, being going there too. India was like such an impact on me because these girls, you, they have letters like their parents sold them for fifty bucks. They grew up in a train station. I mean, the parents are selling you for money, or it, oh, there's story after story like that. And these girls, how they could bounce back. You have no problems here in yeah, America. No problems. <laughs> yeah, America no has problems. no problems. I mean, it's like it's sad what people complain about here, but yeah, that was so huge for me too. Like those people I met in India, you know, because that's why I've been there nine times and I I volunteer every time I go there. But it's such a big deal what this group's doing, and so many groups over there are doing a lot of different, making a lot of difference in India. I love being a part of it there, so I highly recommend if anybody gets a good chance to go do something like that in India because that'll really flip you around. You know how good you got it here. Yeah, that is good. <laughs> So go ahead, back to your question. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, yeah. Who's who's uh, you know who's been kind of the biggest mentor in your life? It's weird. I, I haven't really had any mentors because mm -hmm. I, I lost my dad early, my parents early. It's just been me just kind of figuring things out on my own the whole time. Because most like a lot of people I hung out with early on in life weren't making the right decisions, so I jumped ship from there. Yeah. Um, I think the mentor would be my mom, even though she's passed. It, I always thought how because she was such a good mom and how she would think. Of what I'm decisions I'm making, mm -hmm. I think I was reflected back there. Yeah, because even through school, I was just an okay student. I was just making, you know, getting through school, and I went to college. So I never really had a really true mentor. I would say, um, it just what I thought. Who, like, say, my mom looking? What my mom would think of me now? That was like my inspiration. I would think. Yeah, yeah. And then my kids when they were born so young, I knew I had to come through for them. Yeah. You know, thank goodness I did. Like my son grew up; he's been, he was a Navy SEAL for 13 years. He, was, he, me, he grew That's up to be such an amazing kid. And I could have easily made a decision not to have that kid. You know, but then they're such good kids. And my, you know, my daughter's great. So it's just, you know, that was my inspiration. The kids and my mom. <laughs> I would call them mentors, even though they weren't showing me how to do anything. I just knew I had to make things happen for them. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I looked at it. I didn't really have a mentor. All right. Last question. Sure. What, what would you say to young Jim Kim Kennedy if you could talk to him today? Yeah. I think about that question sometimes. I know because I've heard those, that question asked many times, you know, at different podcasts, but, um, it's hard to say, you know, because I feel like you could look back and say, hey, maybe don't make, make this mistake, don't make that mistake. But then again, if I didn't make those mistakes, it might have changed my life. So I, I do think about the question to me, it's hard to really say, you know, I guess the biggest, I, I, I just don't really have one. To be honest. I guess I looking back, I really don't have one. It sounds crazy to say that because I feel like if I told myself to do something differently, it would have changed my life. And, and you I, wouldn't do anything different. I wouldn't do anything different. Mm -hmm. Even the mistakes I made definitely had to be made, you know, and, you know, even though I would never want my kids to make those mistakes or I thank goodness they didn't. But the fact that I came out of another, on the other, came out the other end, I mean, I, why, why would I change it? Because say I was the perfect model student and went to college and didn't fall down the wrong path. Then I might've been fell into some normal, normal life. I mean, the kind of the life I didn't want. And then you would have got, would not have gotten married in Myanmar. Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. exactly. That kind of stuff. So that kind of stuff might not ever happen. You know, so I, that's what I think about when you look back, what would you tell yourself? You know, just, you just, just enjoy life, you know, be happy. I guess like the thing is like, I, which I am, it's like, it's like what's the most important life? Be happy. Mm. And if you're happy, you live good, you have, you're no stress, you're healthy, you know, stress will kill you, all that stuff. So I just, be, be happy is the key. I remember I saw a TED talk a kid did once, and that, he was like a 13 year old kid, he did a TED talk. He was like one of my favorite TED talks and his parents would tell him like, what do you wanna be your girl? He's like, he, he, he would tell his parents, I just wanna be happy. And, that, and that, at least that's perfect. So. That's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. So, well, and I, it's been incredible sitting down and chatting with you. I appreciate you taking the time. Sure. What's uh, what's next for for Jim Kennedy? Just keep at it. You know, I um, keep my property business going. People say, "How long are you going to do this for, Jim?" Like, people say, "Are we going to retire, Jim?" It's like I always tell people, "Like, retired twenty years ago. Once my business took off, I was retired." Because I'll never be the retirement sit around and do nothing guy. You know, I've been retired. I've done everything I want to do. I travel when I want. I do what I want. I live the perfect life. So, you could be retired at. You know, 28 years old, if you do things right, you still got to work. But if you enjoy what you're doing, mm. it's that like cliche. If you love what you're doing, you never work another day in your life. That whole saying, <laughs> it's kind of cheesy, <laughs> but it's true. It's true. <laughs> you know, so I like doing weddings. I can do what I want. You know, and it's like I retired 20 years ago. I said, I'm never going to retire. That's why I'm not going to retire. I'm going to always do something. And I can keep doing this wedding thing forever. You know, it's until I just, I guess my brides retire me. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I, I don't know. The future holds is more travel more projects to see what the next projects might lead me. I'm looking forward to get back out doing those tours again. Yeah. Uh, I've just been waiting things to get totally back to normal. We're getting there. So that's good. You know, yeah. That's the future. More, right. more weddings, <laughs> more weddings, more travel. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, Hey, great to spend time with you. Thanks for coming to the studio. Yeah. Thank you. Good deal. Mm -hmm.